I've titled this message tonight, John the Baptist and Lucian or Lucan Theology. And I want to, um, maybe over the next several weeks, look at this subject. And um, what it's dealing with is John the Baptist, as he is introduced to us, and basically the narrative of his life and a lot of the things that took place um, in the New Testament. And also, as we move into the book of Acts, um, how we see John the Baptist there as well. Um, He is mentioned in several places, but at the same time, there are allusions to his teachings and his message uh, that exists as well. So, I want to begin tonight with this topic as sort of an introduction, and we're not going to get anything really heavy, um, and it'll probably be a relatively short message, if you will, but John the Baptist in Lucan or Lucian theology. First, who was Luke, the beloved physician? Who was Luke, the beloved physician? And we're going to answer that. Who was John the Baptist? Thirdly, I want to talk about some details of John's life and his message in the Lucan or the Lucian corpus, just a fancy way of saying in the writings that Luke, the beloved physician, uh, wrote. And then finally, the centrality of John's message in Paul's theology. I want to explore that because it's important that we understand the influence of John the Baptist in Paul's theology, because a lot of times we don't realize that John's message was certainly central to Paul's theology. First of all, who was Luke the beloved physician? Um, He was a Greek physician who lived in Antioch and was contemporary with the apostles, basically meaning that um, he was probably similar in age to Matthew, Mark, and the other apostles. He was a historian, and he was a biographer who went around with Paul the Apostle, as we'll talk about a little bit later, and sort of wrote down as the Spirit uh, guided him and empowered him uh, the narrative that we find in the book of Acts. He wrote the two-volume Luke-Acts, as it's kind of come to be known about the last hundred years, Um, the book of Luke and the book of Acts are basically his works. Now, some scholars believe that he wrote the book of Hebrews, but there's not a lot of evidence to prove that. Um, The book of Hebrews, to me, was most likely written by Luke, the beloved physician. And uh, again, he was a physician, as physicians were in those days, certainly wouldn't have the training that we have today, but uh, in his day, he was, a, he was a physician, or he was a doctor. Luke accompanied Paul again on his second missionary journey, and at other times in his ministry, he was with Paul when he was in Rome, and he was presumably with Paul at his death. So, I kind of think of Luke as sort of one of Paul's close right-hand men, and um, the things that Luke wrote would have definitely been influenced by Paul, and um, so I see these things as kind of a couplet. You have the writings of Luke, and you have Paul's theology, and these things all kind of go together. The narrative in Acts will occasionally contain uh, the personal pronoun "we." So Paul, will, uh, I'm sorry, Luke will say things like "we," and then he will he will give a description of what was going on. Uh, He was an eyewitness to many things that are written uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke is believed to have died, I want to say, some scholars say around the year 84 A.D., but somewhere between 80 and 90 A.D. And of course our picture here is just an artist's rendition. Uh, When you go back 2,000 years, it's anybody's guess what Luke would have looked like. Um, He was again a Greek. He was the only non-Jew Uh, to write any of the scriptures, as far as we know of. All of the other books of the Bible were written by people who were Jewish. Uh, Now, some scholars, again, will say, well, he was a Hellenized Jew, uh, which basically means that 
he was a Jew, but he had been influenced by Hellenism, which was the Greek philosophy and culture uh, of the time and other things that we can say about that. But nevertheless, uh, I think that the evidence points to the fact that he was in fact a Greek and um, he was the only Gentile or non-Jew, if you will, that wrote any of the scriptures. The second question I asked, who is John the Baptist? Well, I will answer that. The first thought that came to my mind was he's one of the most important figures in all of the Bible. Um, he was the last Old Testament prophet. Um, when you look at the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, it's the last book of the Old Testament, um, the old timers used to say that that white piece of paper that says the New Testament or whatever it says that divides the Old Testament from the New Testament in your Bible represents 400 years where God was not speaking prophetically uh, to His people. And it's known as the intertestamental period or uh, less formally the 400 years of silence. Uh, John the Baptist was the Elijah figure who was prophesied in the Old Testament uh, to, quote, prepare the way of the Lord. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. And that's probably the primary, going to be the primary emphasis of this particular entry tonight. His birth was prophesied by an angel and was supernatural in nature. Uh, his parents were past age of having children, um, but nevertheless, the Lord promised that he would be born, and uh, there's quite a story behind that which we won't go into because it's pretty familiar. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, um, meaning that from the very time he came into the world, the hand of God was upon his life. He was a Nazarite. Uh, this is a word that means he was consecrated in a special way based upon certain Old Testament prescribed rules and laws, uh, a person could in the Old Testament uh, take what was known as a Nazarite vow. And what would happen uh, with the Nazarite vow is that uh, a person would sanctify themselves to the Lord in a unique way, sort of like a priest. Uh, they weren't priests, generally speaking, but they could sanctify themselves to the Lord in such a way that God could use them uniquely, again, much in the same way that he used the priests. Um, some of the Nazarites that come to mind, one of them uh, would have been Samson. He was a Nazarite. He had took a Nazarite vow. Uh, he was instructed the Lord never to cut his hair. He was not to drink or eat anything that came from grapes. He wasn't to touch a dead body, a uh, dead carcass, and so on and so forth. So they had these rules, if you will, if, if I could say it that, or they had these uh, prohibitions and things like that that enabled them to be separated to the Lord in a unique way. Now sometimes the Nazarites would take a vow for a short period of time, and, and through that time, you know, they would be consecrated to the Lord for whatever they were doing, and uh, others were consecrated as a Nazarite for life. And um, John the Baptist was a Nazarite for his whole life. He lived outside the city on a diet, the scripture said, of locusts and wild honey. Now, locusts were grasshoppers. I've had conversations with people who lived in Israel, who were kind of the boots on the ground, if you will. And they have contacts and they've done studies and uh, you know attended university and stuff there. And there's a possibility that the, the whole idea of, of locusts and things like that, that could have been some type of a plant that he was eating. But it's unclear really what it was. Um, personally, I lean to the fact that he probably was eating uh, grasshoppers. Maybe that's just because I want to think of him being that kind of a guy. He preached the word of repentance to the people with the view to getting their hearts right with God on an individual level. Um, for example, he challenged Herod for his adultery. Herod had married his own brother's wife, Herodias. When he challenged them on this, it created quite a stir, to say the least, and ultimately that resulted in his death. 
But John the Baptist was a very powerful preacher, and uh, he was a prophet who performed no miracles. Now, Elijah, as you know, called fire down from heaven. Some of the other prophets saw people raised from the dead, but not with John the Baptist. But nevertheless, Jesus said, no man was greater than John the Baptist who had been born of women. Meaning that basically he was the greatest man who ever lived apart from Jesus Christ. If there were equals, there were no greater. So that's a powerful thing to consider. But Jesus went on to say, nevertheless, he that's least in the kingdom is greater than him. Which is is raising the bar quite a bit. His message was rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, The Bible said that they rejected the counsel of God. They rejected uh, the word that John the Baptist brought. In other words, when he called them to repent and to go out into uh, the water to be baptized and to confess their sins and to determine they're going to turn away from their sins, they didn't listen to the message. They felt like they were above him. Basically, they just rebelled against God. Now, it's important to know that John the Baptist was really just a voice. If you would ask him, John, who are you? He would probably say, I'm a voice. Uh, I'm the mouthpiece of God. I'm speaking what the Lord is saying to the people. Um, Again, his job was to make straight the way of the Lord or to prepare a path. And I often say that What John was doing is he was getting the people's heart right with God so that God could come straight into them. For centuries, God had been away and separated from the people. Adam and Eve departed from the garden. That fellowship and that relationship was broken. And eventually, God would begin to interact with his people again. He interacted with people individually up until the time of Abraham. And then... On a much larger scale, he started to deal with the people. But ultimately, his desire was to be among his people at first, because this was sort of like one step, uh, as it were, back towards what God's ultimate design was. And, um, of course, they built the wilderness tabernacle. God dwelled in the tabernacle uh, above the mercy seat, the Holy of Holies. Eventually, they built a temple, And uh, God came down into that temple in what we know as a theophany, which is just a fancy way of saying God uniquely manifesting himself at a particular place and time. But understand that the purpose of God all the time was to not live in a temple made with hands, not to live in a wilderness tabernacle, which was sort of like a mobile palace that God ruled his people from uh, when they were in the wilderness and then later in the promised land. Um, But he wanted to live in man. Not just among man, but in man. Um, Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth, was the temple of the Holy Spirit. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And uh, he didn't just want to be a temple himself, but he said, it's expedient or it's good that I would go. and be with the Father, because if I don't go, the Comforter can't come. So Jesus wanted everyone who would repent of their sins and truly make Him the Lord of their life, uh, that He could come in and cleanse the temple, something that we saw played out many times in the Old Testament under the Levitical priesthood. He would cleanse this temple so that the Holy Spirit could come and live in us, and we could be filled with His Spirit, become temples as well. So this was the message of John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one coming who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, so on and so forth. So John the Baptist gave us the message that Christ is coming. You need to get your... Uh, heart right with the Lord because the Messiah is coming. He's coming to live in you uh, and He's going to dwell in you. And that was His message. Now I want to talk about John the Baptist's life just a little bit and His message and what we would call 
technically the Lucan or the Lucian corpus, which is just a fancy way of saying in the writings that Luke the physician wrote, which was the book of Acts and the book of Luke. Luke is interesting because he talks about John the Baptist more than anyone else. Now you have Matthew, who, who obviously writes about John the Baptist. You have Mark, who writes about John the Baptist. But Luke is different than the others. Uh, he has a tremendous focus on John the Baptist. As a matter of fact, he talks about his birth narrative, which was supernatural, um, which is interesting coming from a physician because he would realize that uh, his parents, John's parents, were too old to have children. So he understood from a physiological point of view the impossibility of them having children. So he writes very carefully about how John the Baptist came into the world supernaturally. And you find various blocks of material, and uh, if I could just say a few of them, I've got them uh, in my notes, but we'll maybe come back to them later, maybe next week or the week after. But in John chapter 1, verse 5 to 25, you have the prophecy of uh, John the Baptist's birth. Verses 57 through 80, you see he's born, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins to move into his ministry in chapter 3, verse 1 through 20. And then we find him again in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse, verses 18 through 35. So there's quite a bit of material there, and there's quite a focus there. And that's important to me, because again, Luke was basically Paul's biographer. And he was Paul's, one of his right-hand men. So when I think about the emphasis of John the Baptist in Luke's writings... I am immediately uh, thinking that Paul the Apostle likewise shared that emphasis. So it's almost like Luke and Paul are working hand in hand uh, in their theology. When we read the book of Romans and other places, and don't usually get the impression that Paul the Apostle really had much emphasis, or, or if you could say it that way, he didn't really have a lot of time for John the Baptist. Well, that was that isn't true at all. And we find that if we follow the narrative in the book of Acts. And uh, we understand truly what Paul preached, especially to people who were not born again, who were sinners. And that's what you have to understand. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible talks about the foundation of repentance being laid. Once it's laid, don't relay it again. Well, why would Paul need to talk about John the Baptist's message or John the Baptist at all? when he's talking to the churches. If he's talking to the church at Thessalonica or Ephesus or uh, you know any of the churches, the churches at Galatia, he wouldn't need to talk about John the Baptist's message to them in those writings because the people were already born again. They had already gone through the process of repentance and turning their life over to the Lord. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think you find it as much in the epistles. When you get to the book of Acts, there are several places that are mentioned uh, or, or that make reference to John the Baptist. And these are presented in what we would kind of call a paracope, which is just a fancy way of saying a snippet or a piece of scripture that just kind of relates back to him. And that would be uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, 1, verse 22, Acts 10, 37. 11, 16, Acts 13, verses 24 to 25, and then in Acts chapter 18, verse 25. There are others as well, and um, we will talk about them. Actually, we'll, we'll probably close with, with these tonight. Now, again, in Luke chapter 3, verse 4, it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make his paths straight. Okay? Now, when you see that word straight, that's a Greek word that's used only a handful of times in the New Testament. The other time we find that word, in the book of Acts, that is, is in Acts 13, verse 10, where Paul is talking to someone who is really acting out, and he says to them, O full of subtlety and mischief, 
you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert or to twist the right ways of the Lord? Now that word right there in the Greek is the same Greek word as straight in Luke chapter 3 verse 4. But it is translated as right in Acts uh, chapter 13 verse 10. So what we see then is that there is a way in which God has communicated to us His truth, which are really revelations of His personality just put down on paper. You have to, in one sense, describe what it means uh, to love your neighbor or to love the Lord. And um, these are the ways of the Lord, as we could say at that, or the right ways of the Lord. But nevertheless, this person was twisting these things, rejecting these things, and uh, Paul called him full of subtlety and mischief, a child of the devil. Now, there's another individual that I want to just talk about briefly. His name is Simon the Sorcerer. He shows up in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 19 through 22. Here's a guy who heard the message of the gospel, uh, believed and I put that word believed in quotation marks, uh, believed in as much as the scripture declares that he believed, he was baptized in water, and the next step for him was to receive the Holy Spirit. So here is Peter, and, and they're laying hands on folks, they're receiving the Holy Spirit, and in the process of them receiving the Holy Spirit, something supernatural was happening that Simon the sorcerer saw, uh, he could see obvious demonstrations of power. I don't know what the people were doing. I don't know what the reaction was. It's likely, obviously, that they spoke with tongues and other things happened when they received the Holy Spirit. But whatever it was that he saw, he was so taken by it that he asked Peter if he could buy that power with money. Which clearly, as we know, is blasphemy. I mean, it is blasphemous to think that you could buy the power of God with money to lay hands on people and have them receive the Holy Spirit or to be healed or to any other thing. And this particular passage of Scripture, to me, is one of the most significant portions of the book of Acts because it demonstrates to us that it is possible for a person to hear the gospel, to appear to respond to the gospel, to even be baptized in water, and yet still, as we're about to read, their heart is not right in the sight of the Lord. Now let's read what he says here. Simon says to Peter, Give me this power that to whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, Your money perish with you. The King James says, Thy money perish with thee. What does that tell us? If his money is going to perish with him, that means he's already perishing. See? You see that. Your money perish with you. Because you have thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of thy wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Now Peter wasn't one of these guys that would just kind of throw forgiveness out like it was free. Which it is free in one sense. But he wasn't quick to let this guy off the hook. I mean, he has, he has practically blasphemed the Holy Spirit here. And he's telling this guy to repent of his wickedness and pray if perchance the Lord would forgive him of what he was attempting to do. Now, when you look at this section of the verse where it says, For thy heart is not right, that is the same Greek word that's used in Luke chapter 3, verse 4, where John the Baptist's job was to make his paths straight. 
And what I generally say here is that it is clear from the text that this man, Simon the Sorcerer, had not been through the process of getting his heart right with God in the John the Baptist sense of the word. Now, when John the Baptist came preaching the word of repentance, he expected the people to, in his words, bring forth evidence or fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, they were to demonstrate by their actions that they had truly turned to the Lord, that their mind had changed and they had turned. Uh, when we think of repentance, we're thinking of two words. One of the Greek words is metanoia. It means to change your mind. There's another word that means to do 180 or to turn or to return. So, when a person truly agrees with God, again, agrees with the right ways of the Lord, Acts 13 verse 10, when they truly agree with that, their mind comes into agreement with what God is saying. Again, unlike the Pharisees who rejected the word of the Lord that was coming from John, hearing the word of God, changing your mind, and turning from your evil ways, and turning so as to have your heart right with the Lord. Now, a lot of people, in my mind, are like Simon the Sorcerer. They have believed they have maybe even been baptized in water. And now they are trying, some of them have received something, thinking perhaps, I'm saying this is a particular group of people, thinking that they had received the Holy Spirit, but they have received another spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. Why? Because their heart was not right with God. I ask people, uh, sometimes when I'm reading this, what do you think would happen if Peter would not have called him out and pointed him out for his evil? What if while laying hands on all the other people, he laid hands on Simon the sorcerer and never said a word, and because the guy was already obviously perishing, could have even, arguably, still been either possessed or oppressed by the demons he was using with his sorcery, to bewitch the people, which he was doing that. He made it living it doing it. And he had bewitched the people with his sorcery. He had been duped, you know, and he was using demonic powers. Well, obviously he was getting those demonic powers from some type of demonic force or demonic spirit. He didn't get his heart right with God. Um, you know, he never had his heart truly swept and garnished. He was going through the motions. He was in line like everyone else, to get the hands laid on him and all of that. Uh, but he wasn't right with God. And um, if Peter hadn't called him out, he may have laid hands on the guy. That demonic spirit may have manifested and imitated some of the stuff the other people were doing. The guy would have got up and said, Yes, I've got the Holy Spirit. The next thing you know, they would have took the guy out, put him inside some place of leadership in the church, and the guy would have been ruling in the church, doing something in the church, teaching, administrating, pastoring, you, you name it. And the truth was, the guy was full of the devil. That's how dangerous it is to try to receive the Holy Spirit when your heart's not right with the Lord. It's a dangerous thing to do. And I think we are warned here. But John the Baptist, when he came, his job was to get the people's heart right with the Lord. You know, we... We have the language of make his path straight. Of course, we know the Romans used to you know, level the land out so when they made an entrance, have a big parade and all this, and they wanted to be able to see him so they would level the land out. We know all that. But the reality is, apart from whatever image is there, is that the, the job or, or the purpose of John the Baptist in ministering the way he did was to get their heart right with the Lord. He would tell them some radical stuff. He said, you brood of vipers, in other words, call them snakes. You know, who has warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? And don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, he said, because God is able of stones to raise children up unto Abraham. 
See, they were hanging on to uh, the belief that, well, we're Abraham's seed. You know, we're automatically right with God. We're automatically entitled to the promises. We're automatically in the kingdom. He said, not so. He said, the axe is now laid to the root of the tree. Trees, plural, every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is going to be cut down and cast into the fire. So, he's telling the people that from this point forward, it's a new day. Um, it's time to get your heart right with the Lord. It's time to prepare yourself to receive the Lord uh, and to receive His Holy Spirit. Not in a pretentious way. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, and I've seen this happen in churches, you know, the altar call is given. Maybe their friend went up front, so they went up too. And their heart was no more right with God than anything. But they went up front too. And you know what? They may have said a little prayer up front too. And, and then when it came time to lay hands on them, they may have given some kind of unintelligible words out of their mouth. And then people said, oh, they've got the Holy Spirit. And uh, all this type of stuff. But when your heart is truly right with the Lord, and you receive the Holy Spirit, and He comes in, you will go from the tree that is bringing forth, in the language of Hebrews, thorns and briars, to bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit. And that's how you know. The tree is known by its fruit. Simon the sorcerer was given off a bunch of foul fruit. Some people wouldn't have discerned it. Peter did. He called him on the carpet. Your money perish with you, you don't have a part or a lot in this matter. Your heart's not right with the Lord. Repent of your wickedness. So he brought him back to that place. I guess better late than never to hear the word of repentance. But uh, we don't know what happened with Simon. We don't know if he went out and got his act together or what. And uh, But we do know that that was the message. But this is the emphasis that we find in the Lucan or the Lucian Corpus it's this emphasis on truly repenting, truly getting your heart right with the Lord, and then truly receiving the Holy Spirit, or in the language of John the Baptist, being baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, I just want to pray tonight before uh, we, we close this meeting. Lord, we're just grateful tonight for the record that you've given us in the Scriptures, in the New Testament. Lord, we're grateful for the writings of Luke, Lord, that the book of Luke and the book of Acts that you've given us, Lord, to help us to understand how all these things fit together. Lord, to help us make sense of Paul's writings, to, to help fill in the blanks, if you will, uh, in understanding Paul's theology, especially in terms of soteriology or the study of salvation or uh, in his evangelism and seeing people come to the Lord rightly. Lord, we're grateful for these writings. And we know that the scripture says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for instruction, for doctrine, reproof, etc. Lord, help us to recognize that the book of Luke and the book of Acts are vital to understanding Paul's theology. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.